Well, welcome to our Roundtable Bible Study again. We're glad you're joining us here in Studio 5B at Grace Bible Church. Uh, we are uh, continuing our study in the parables of Jesus. And uh, uh, lately we've been in the theme of the parables that include seed, his use of seed. And so we're looking at one today from Matthew chapter 13. The parable is in verses 24 to 30. If you have a copy of the scriptures, you're welcome to join with us in that. My guest today is Ernie Hodges. Thank, Thank you. you, Ernie, for joining us again. And uh, we're looking forward to unpacking the scriptures, hopefully with some, some very helpful, relevant truths for us as the church. So uh, you're welcome to follow along with us in Matthew chapter 13. Ernie, if you would please read verses 24 to 30. Okay, gladly. Um, Matthew 13, starting at verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay, so there's the parable that Jesus gives. So let's, uh, we haven't done this for a while, Ernie. Let's review for a moment. It says at the beginning, he put another parable before them. So remind us again, what is a parable? Why did Jesus use parables? Well, the, the idea of parables, they were word stories that, that taught a spiritual lesson. Uh, and Jesus used parables because it says in Scripture, to some are given the things of the kingdom of God, to others that are not. So they're given, so that when he gave them to a large crowd, those that were spiritual discerning would get his message, but those that were not prepared would not. Yeah, so there is a, there's an element of veiled truth in the parable yeah. there. For, for those who uh, are of God, for those who would believe, they would get the message. For those who would not, um, they heard truth, but they did not get, they did not understand the message. Their, their hearts were, were hardened. What's interesting about this parable, this is, this is one of those that Jesus gives an explanation for it. And it comes a little bit later. So uh, that's in verses 36 to 43. So we can turn there. If you would read that for us, please, and give us the explanation of the parable. Okay. So in Matthew 13, starting at verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears, let him hear." And that's a telling statement right there at the end, he who has ears, let him hear, right? So Jesus, he's giving this parable for those who do have the ears to hear it. So again, as we've been studying parables to talk about seed, usually the seed represents the Word of God, the, Word of God, the truth, right? But this case is different. Mm -hmm. What does the seed represent in this parable? Well, the seed here represent the, the hearers. 
themselves. The hearers themselves. It's mm -hmm. people that are yeah. being represented. And, uh, and, and the hearers themselves, the, the sons of the kingdom, as he says in his explanation. So that would be those of us who are representatives of truth, those of us who know the truth and therefore are representatives of, of the truth. Right. And, and therefore, as the wheat, the wheat grows and it produces, and so that fruitfulness there is, is, is the idea there. Uh, the, 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 good, the good seed, the good wheat. Um, I think what's, what's important to, to see in this is it, 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 as the wheat represents our lives, your life and my life, it represents a whole season. The, the, the wheat grows up, it matures, it produces, and then eventually it's gathered. And, and that whole scenario right there represents the span of your life and mine. You know, that's what our lives are about. So it, the Lord makes that, that clear in this, in this analogy, in this, in this parable right here, uh, that the, the, the purposefulness of our lives, it's not just a matter of existence. So now, when it talks about the enemy coming and sowing weeds, um, so if the seeds, if, if the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, then what would the weeds be in this case? Oh, well, the, the weeds would be f false truth that the evil one, Satan, is sowing in their hearts yeah. to keep them from believing the word of truth. Yeah, as uh, he says here... Um, sons of the evil sons ones. Sons of the evil one. You know, so in other words, essentially God knows from all eternity, there are two kinds of people, those who belong to him and those who do not. And, and God knows all of them, who, who they are. And so the enemy is, an enemy is one who opposes, right? So the Son of Man, God, Christ, has his people in the world, right? And, and he knows who they are. And uh, the enemy is the one who opposes. So therefore, if we are the ones who represent, we know the truth, we represent truth, the enemy is the one who opposes truth, people who oppose truth. And so what this, what this is telling us is that we're living in the same place, right? The wheat and the weeds are growing together. Um, I mean, that's pretty common in any field. Right. To some degree, isn't it? So, um, the the wheat, the the weeds that are described here, uh, we would call them today. It's like a darnel. It it looks very very similar to wheat until the wheat matures and starts producing that ear of the grain on top. At that point, you can distinguish the wheat from the weeds because the weeds don't produce that wheat. Right. It's just like nowadays, there are, there are people uh, in the world who are very kind, gracious, um, uh, moral type people that just looking on the surface of their, of their lives, sometimes you may not see a difference between them and actual true believers. Because mm -hmm. as we know, they're believers that sometimes are not always walking in truth. And so that's this concept here. They're going to be separated at the judgment. So... They resemble the wheat. I mean, we're all people. We all look alike. We share the same world, right? We share all the same resources. And, and, and it, one commentator says this, this weed is entirely like wheat until the ear appears. You know, uh, the Lord's until the ear appears, and that's the wheat. And that's, you know, comparable to what Jesus, you will know them by their fruit, right? Uh, so we who are Christ's, our purpose is to produce fruit to the glory of God. That's the, the meaning of our lives. But I think something that comes out from this, too, is the fact that weeds were intentionally sown among the wheat. What do you make of that? What, what, what is the reality of that? that's relevant to us even today. Well, Satan certainly wants to uh, disrupt the kingdom of God. Christ came to set up the kingdom of God. He referenced that time and time again. And Satan knew why he was here. So he's trying to disrupt all that by getting his people out there to confuse the spiritual realities that exist. Very true. There is, there's no doubt, and something that we as Christians need to be constantly aware of, 
And, and, and let me back up a little bit. It's something that we as Americans with our Judeo-Christian heritage, we're used to receiving all the deference of, 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 of the cultural norms and, and the, uh, of, of our culture, American culture, right, that has its roots in Judeo-Christian values. We're seeing that slip away, right? But even, even today, we have to recognize as Christians that we live amongst opposition. It is a normal thing for us to live in the context of opposition, that there is an active countering to the gospel. And I think we're seeing that more and more become a reality for us today with the cultural revolution that's going on as we speak. Um, I, just, uh, I just received a communication from a brother in Christ just as an example, he said this, he says, we really need to provide support for fellow believers given the dark forces that are using the pandemic and civil unrest and cancel culture to keep us isolated. And he's speaking as an academician, one who teaches at a university, right? He says, I have been attacked repeatedly throughout my career. University faculty and administrators often can be very vicious. But God always delivers, he says. That's what he says in his email to me. And uh, I think, well, that's, that's so telling. And it's, it's so true because there is an active opposition to the truths of God and, and particularly to the gospel. And spiritual growth, we can assume and expect that spiritual growth is accompanied by opposition, an attempt to disrupt growth and to disrupt that good fruit, which, which you know, Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 6. What's going on in reality? There is a spiritual war going on, which is why we need the armor of God. How would you describe that, that spiritual battle? He says we're not fighting against people, per se. We're fighting against spiritual forces of darkness. Well, it's there every single day. Yeah. And we can always be tempted as we're, we're facing struggles, uh, new, our challenges come our way to try and figure out how to do it in the arm of the flesh, just our own human thinking uh, minus the Holy Spirit of God. And it's so important that we dwell in God's Word every day to get new nourishment yeah. in this in this struggle, and then use that that we've received in our battle, and not try to do it on our own. Hmm. It's important. I think it's really good that you say that because as as we go on in the parable, um, it, it talks about the servants come and they discern. Hey, there's weeds among the wheat. You know, the weeds are not going to produce anything. Master, do you want us to uproot the weeds? And what does the master say? No, leave them there together. Leave them there, why? why? Because they'll be separated at the harvest. And if you uproot the weeds now, you might... Disturb the, the wheat You might that's uproot growing. the wheat, yeah. yeah. So if, if you uproot... So in, gathering weeds is a picture of, of judgment, where God takes out, and it's a picture of judgment, the gathering the weeds. But that makes you... That, that begs the question, what does he mean that pulling up the weeds now could harm the the wheat yeah that's that's a good question you know we we could potentially you know if he says the servants are the angels of god you know and they're the ones mm -hmm. that are going to be reaping right if they come and they destroy and they take out all the evil opposition in that judgment it could be that some of god's people are no longer able to be productive, or, the, or they might be destroyed along with that in a judgment. Well, it, it also kind of, I think, reflects the actual nature of, our, of the current age, mm -hmm. and that is the Christian life is not designed to where it is to be lived in exclusion. With, uh, we are to rely on the Holy Spirit of God to help us with temptation, and that's part of the whole process of living for God in, a, in an era like this. We don't have to be in a holy 
community with no temptation whatsoever in order to right. live for God. Right. Very, very, very true. It, and I had some of the same thoughts in my notes, and I'm thinking like what Peter said, we shouldn't be surprised at the opposition and the pushback. We should expect it. It's a natural thing living in a fallen created order that uh, there are those who are not children of God, therefore their father is the devil. John says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So we have to understand that that's the context in which we live, that we should expect opposition, right? And that is part of that which contributes to our own spiritual growth and, growth and, and fruit production as well. God's people, like you said, God's people are not intended to live in isolation in this world. Uh, you remember Jesus' prayer to the Father in John chapter 17. He says something very striking in verse 15. He says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you protect them from the evil one. Now that's a comforting verse, and I'm sure that's very much something Jesus had in mind even as he was giving this parable, right? Because the wheat is the wheat, and, and that represents the sons of the kingdom, we who are God's people. And we are growing, we are maturing, we are producing. And so the master says, let, them, let the wheat continue to grow and mature and produce fruit. That's what the wheat is for. Uh, it, it's not, the, the purpose of the wheat is not to get rid of all the weeds. Mm -hmm. See? And that, that, I think, gives us a, a, a good understanding of what the mission of the church is and what it is not. So, um, we share, like I said before, we share the same world with those who would oppose us. The same earth, the same resources. Uh, the same life, the same neighborhoods even, sometimes even the same household. We share all of that in common with unbelievers and even those who would oppose us. But the wheat can continue to mature and produce. Uh, the mission of God's servants is not to get rid of the wheats. Okay. Expand on that, what I just said. You know, if thinking of us as the church, thinking of our immediate context today, the cancel culture, the cultural revolution, the mission of the church is not to get rid of the weeds. Well, we have a mission to share the gospel and, and bring as many of them into the kingdom as we can, but we know that not all will. But it's not our job to control culture. Uh, or uh, in institute laws and regulations that make the tares live as though that they are Christians. Um, we have the added struggle now with the, with the global pandemic. It is very easy to become isolated at this point in time. Um, I mean, if you're not actively going out and seeking Christian resources online, listening to messages um, uh, that we have recorded here online, um, you could become isolated very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And at first you say, well, I'm doing it to protect myself and my family. That's true. We were supposed to isolate, mm -hmm. self-control, that sort of thing. But it can become... If it goes on a long time, I could see Christians developing a habit of not gathering together with, with believers. Mm -hmm. And tr it's true that they can't necessarily gather if their church is not having services, but what are you doing to get in God's Word on a daily basis and build your own spirit up during this time? Yeah. Even more so now than before because you're not getting to see people at church and have close communion and fellowship with them unless you're making an active effort and doing it virtually. Very true. So, so the challenge for us is, even in our immediate context today, whether it's the opposition or the isolation, we still as the wheat represented in this parable, sons of the kingdom, people of God, we still are to be growing, maturing, producing fruit as the wheat. Yes, we're not given an excuse to take a, 
a spiritual hiatus, right. a, exactly. a, a sabbatical, and, and stop growing and stop reaching out because it can, we can do it even uh, with all the technology we have at our disposal. We should be doing that. Right. Okay. So um, coming down then to the end, he says in the parable, um, let both grow together until the harvest. What does the harvest represent? No, the harvest would represent the judgment, the, the second coming of Christ, to set up his actual um, temporal kingdom here on earth. And there's so many examples of that in Scripture where Christ comes, and, and when he comes, there is a clear judgment. Judgment in two senses. One, judgment in the, in the sense of discriminating making a difference between, deciding between, these are my people, these are not. My people are here, the others are not. The sheep and the goats, for example. In this case, it's the wheat versus the weeds, mm -hmm. right? One, clearly, I mean, they might look the same, but clearly they are very, very different because weeds are not wheat. They do not produce that fruit that glorifies God. And when Christ comes, he is going to gather. His servants will gather the weeds into bundles to be burned. That's a judgment. And yet he says, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. That's a, that's a coming judgment that we can expect. Um, that is... That is a confidence that we have, an assurance that we have of God's justice. How can, how can that help us today, Ernie, uh, in the context that we're in, that we can have an assurance, a very strong confidence that God's justice will prevail? Well, God is a holy God. He's a God who's fair, who's, who is just. In the end, his justice will prevail, even though it may look like at a particular time in our experience and our history that that's not happening. That's because this is still a fallen world. Satan is still here spreading his tares, uh, bring, uh, bringing his, his evil people to places of power to, to affect things. But regardless of what we see happening now, do not be fooled. God is not mocked. He will ultimately set up his kingdom and he will rule with all authority here on earth and all justice will be established at that point. You know, his, his throne, it, righteousness is the scepter of his throne as the psalmist says, right? And so Christ is the righteous ruler. He rules with righteousness and he is the one who is going to rule. And, and he will establish a kingdom of righteousness and we will rule with him. And so um, in our context, let's look to that day with that end in view. And, and that should give us confidence to persevere and move forward, even though there will be, and we should expect opposition today, we can persevere with confidence knowing and being assured of the justice of God in this world. So uh, the judgment is coming. And, and for the family of God, he says at the very end here, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, clearly the wheat, again, represents the people of God. Gather the wheat into my barn. Um, the way I would uh, just make a comment about that is that we who are the family of God, we who are God's people, we always have a place that we call home, and that's with God. He is preparing that place for us. Gather the wheat into my barn, that we will be with Him. That is our home. We have a home that we look forward to, and that gives us a confident hope. That gives us a joy to be able to continue being productive, to continue being that maturing, fruitful wheat, even in the context of opposition. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts on this, Ernie, that you feel are, are uh, relevant to the church, uh, helpful to the church, encouraging to the church as, as we close out our study on this? Well, I think I've sort of been sharing that as we go along about uh, our responsibility and the importance of our 
uh, living for God on a daily basis and then sharing the gospel with those that are in the world that are not part of the kingdom yet. Mm. We have a responsibility to do both. Uh, and, it's, and generally speaking, we don't do much in the way of sharing the gospel if we're not drawing closer to God and, and living in His presence on a daily basis. So that's the number one thing we can do is, is draw closer to Him and, mm. and live daily in His presence. And then when the opportunity to share uh, comes to us, it is much more natural. You do, because number one, if you're not drawing closer to God and you have an opportunity to witness, you almost feel like a hypocrite to say that, to do something if you're not, have, not having that daily drawing close to Him. Um, and so that's why it is so important for us to have that daily time with God not just one little set aside time, but that, that we may, we practice praying without ceasing. As we're driving, as we're doing other things, thinking about the things of God so that our hearts are prepared to serve Him. Hmm. Very good. Thank you for that. And as, as we said at the beginning of this, you know, uh, the wheat is, represented, is representative in this of God's people. I am wheat. My life is about being that wheat. And so the purpose of my life, the direction of my life is to grow. It is to mature, mature to the point of producing that grain, producing that fruitful grain. That's God's intent for my life, even in the context of opposition that is out there today. What an encouraging truth that is for us as the church, as, as we who belong to God we are His, and we have a place that we call home so we can persevere with joy and with confidence and hope. So, very good. Thank you, Ernie, for sharing your thoughts with us today. We do certainly appreciate it, and I hope it's been encouraging to the church as we study through this and we consider the parables of Jesus. And if you have any questions about this or you would like to contact the church, you can contact me at pastor at gbcnc. Dot org. Again, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to being with you again next time.